Hi, hi everyone. Thanks so much for joining me today. I am Dr. Wendy Bessler. I'm a little bit off the beaten path as some of you already may know. I did neurology for uh, 10 years before I did psychiatry. So I do neuropsychiatry. So I'm actually gonna show you guys kind of the down and dirty way to actually get a very, very nice, clear neurological exam done. So we're not gonna cover absolutely everything, but it's really, really important that we kind of differentiate what's central versus what's peripheral so that we know exactly what we need to do if that patient needs a, an imaging study of the brain or of the spinal cord or versus an EMG. Okay, so um, let's start from the top. So usually what I would be doing is you would do your normal standard exam. We'd listen to heart and lungs, get blood pressure, all that stuff. But I'm just actually gonna go straight into the neurological part, okay? Well, first of all, hello, Mr. McGuire. It's so very nice to meet you. My name is Dr. Bessler. If you don't mind, I'm gonna just take a little bit of a peek in those eyes first. And then we're gonna do a little basic neurological exam. Is that okay with you? That's fine. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. So what you go on to do first is basically you're going to take a look at the pupils. I always use my pen light. What you want to do is when you're looking at the pupils, I always shade the eyes because of that overhead light. You don't want to get a false read. When you look, you know, quickly shine in the first eye, shine in that second eye and bring off. Now, the second time, because first you're looking for that constriction of each individual pupil. Now remember, when this happens, look at the opposite pupil, because that opposite pupil also should constrict. Now, with some individuals, especially individuals with MS, you are going to find when you do what we call a swing flashlight test, which is you swing from one eye nice and steadily. And can you guys see how both eyes constrict down without an issue? Someone with um, uh, MS that's having problems with that would have abnormal hippus, which means when I would shine that light in the eye and I would swing to the other eye, it would actually lose its ability to constrict and it would actually dilate. That is incredibly important to actually notice. Um, and always be respectful too. Many of your patients with migraine headaches, you don't want to key off the migraines. You can always turn off your overhead lights because that's a real irritant for those individuals as well. Now let's take a look at those eye movements. Look right at my finger, Mr. McGuire. Please follow my finger just with those eyes alone. I always hold the head steady. Follow that finger. Beautiful. Now don't go too slow or too fast on your movements because what you're actually looking for is any kind of saccades, which are these abnormal jerky movements. Now remember, if you truly wanna see every single cranial nerve, including your fourth and sixth, you're gonna to have to do all the way out to the sides like I'm doing here, okay? Because we know on four and six, we've got lateral rectus and, you know, um, and the superior oblique. So those are two that you're gonna actually have to do a little bit extra for. Now, ask your patient to look directly at your finger, follow that finger all the way in. You're gonna move directly towards their nose to see if they can, sorry about that, to see if they can bring those eyes together. So all of those are very important. When you're actually documenting that, you wanna document extra ocular eye movements times six are either intact or saccades and you wanna identify where they're at. Please also remember, if I go out to the extremes of vision, we'll see if I can get him to do that, I will always get a little couple beats of nystagmus. Sorry guys, there it is. Can you guys see it? I don't know if you can see that. It's on his left. All right, we're gonna try one more time, ready? tiny bit. So you'll see a couple of extra beats. That is normal. If you bring somebody to the all the way to the end of their gaze, you will get a couple beats of nystagmus. That's completely normal. Okay. Now I'm going to have you open your mouth for me as well. Good. You want to stick now. This is super important. Have them stick their tongue way out. Say ah, sir. Now, can you see how I can barely see to the back? That's called a malampati. Thank you. Malampati means that's actually how we're actually looking for obstructive sleep apnea issues as well. So when I have the tongue protruding out, if I cannot see the back of the throat at all, that's not good. That's going to be, you know, a malampati, either a three or a four. Um, and that would be an indication too that I would look at, at, you know, the neck circumference. And then I would also ask the patient, hey, sir, do you snore? By the way, he does. Um, 
but that, that's just in between me and, and you, Mr. McGuire. All right, now let's take a look at the rest of you. Do you feel me touch you evenly, sir, on both sides? Yes, I do. How about here and here? Also, yes. Good, here and here? Yes. Beautiful. So remember, you're testing your cranial nerves. Five, give me a big smile with lots of teeth. Good, now when I'm looking at this and I'm looking for symmetry, please, 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 you guys, this is such a, this is really, really important. Always look at the labial folds. Really, the nasal labial folds will always give symmetry away, okay? You know, it's one of the easiest ways to do that. Now, sir, if you don't mind, I'm gonna have you stick your tongue straight out at me. Good, can you move it side to side? Very, very good. Now, also, when you look into his mouth, you're obviously, you're gonna look to see, make sure that palate elevates symmetrically and the uvula as well. So that gives you a little bit of an idea what we're doing. Now, as far as cranial nerves are concerned, always check hearing. And it's just such a simple thing to do. Do you hear that, sir? Yes. Does it sound the same on that side? Yes. Good. Now, you guys know there's a Weber and Rene. We can go through all of that too. But right now, down and dirty, that's the best way to do it, okay? Now, always, always remember, let me cranial nerve, you guys. Always remember this stuff, super important. You want to kind of feel the traps. This is a guy that especially when it comes to cervicogenic headaches, these will be very, very tight. When you feel somebody that's tight, always go and, and palpate the splenius capitis all the way into the base of the occiput because that'll give you a good idea too if we're getting cervicogenic headaches, how much of that, you know, of the traps are actually involved in that as well. Also, whenever I, I do an exam, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm always going to palpate the thyroid too. You guys already know about all that stuff. I do not palpate from the back. I always palpate from the front. I find my midline. I slide out. And then I'll actually push that thyroid over to the side. And you can, you can very clearly, especially on a guy, you can clearly feel the sides of the thyroid. Yes, you can make them swallow, but in all honesty, most of the time, it's pretty easy to feel. Okay, so now, sir, if you don't mind, we're going to test your strength. Strength, very, very important. Again, don't ever forget about the shoulders. Bring those shoulders all the way up because you're looking at that cranial nerve. Don't let me push up. Fight me hard. Good. Bring those elbows all the way up. Don't let me push up. Fight me hard. Very good. Push me away. Hard as you can. Good. Pull towards you. Beautiful. Bring those fingers straight out. Good. Don't let me push you down. Good. Don't let me push you down. Now, you guys know, too, you can do a finger spread as well. If you're dealing with somebody that has, you know, numbness, tingling in the hands, things like that, just have them spread their fingers very, very wide and their thumbs wide as they can. Usually the easiest way is grabbing these fingers. You'll have a little bit of a better idea. Remember what you're actually looking for. You're looking for six, seven Um and a little bit when it comes to this, this is actually, believe it or not, there's, um, we'll go over this in a minute, but sensory level, there's some thoracic intervention. And then C5, sensory wise is up here. Please be cognizant that although we may have weakness here, if we also have weakness here, think about the neck. Okay, always think about the neck. Yes, yes, you can have carpal tunnel. Yes, you can have all of these peripheral issues as well. But just try to think about that whole entire area. All right, and I'm also going to have you hold right here. Bring that knee up for me. Good, don't let me push you. Good, same thing here, sir. Don't let me push you. Good, go ahead and push at me like you're going to kick. Good, pull back for me. Good, and can you take those shoes off for me just for one second? Please always have your patients take those shoes off because that really does give you a lot of good information. Can I have that foot, sir? Now, I'm going to have you flex all the way up towards you. Don't let me pull you down. You're going to pull nice and hard. Now, to test the extensor hallucis longus, okay, you're going to take your pinky, you're going to grab the great toe, and you're going to pull because that's going to be about the right amount of pull on that so that you're not doing this, because of course you'll be able to bring them down. Remember, and that's the, um, your S1. But I make sure you flex up. I'm going to give you a nice pull. Again, taking my pinky, trying to pull that toe down. I can't pull that toe down. That's a five out of five, okay? Now, next I usually go into my reflexes. 
you guys, this is the one thing, just please, 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 the one thing that never lies. Listen, you can have give way, you can have all of that on a patient. They may get confused about sensory stuff, but the one thing that never lies is a reflex that is done right, okay? So when it comes to reflexes, the easiest thing to do Always remember, if the patient is, is anxious or tight, they're gonna block that reflex. So you wanna talk to them, please just go ahead and just really relax, just relax. When I do a reflex, I always tell the patient I try to hit me more than I hit you. Doesn't always work that way, but that's what we're aiming for, okay? I'm actually gonna hit my thumb. If you put that thumb directly over and then you just give it a little hit, it works every single time, you guys. And this way too, talk to your patient, get them not to think about what you're doing because that way you can always get that reflex, okay? Um, you know, brachioradialis is a little bit different. A lot of times I'll just do this and I'll hold on to the hand because if I can't see it, I can feel it come through, all right? And then obviously tricep as well and you just want to have that arm nice and even, and this is a little bit tougher to get, but when you actually get that tricep, remember you're looking for those sensory, this is a, this is a feedback loop. When this is decreased, as far as the reflex is concerned, what I want you to think about is peripheral issues. When this is hyperreflexic, then I want you to think central. That is the most important thing out of all of this, okay? We'll just show you again on this side as well. Same, same exact thing. So just go ahead and just totally relax for me. And you can see how you can get that each and every time. Same thing here. It's going to be very slight, but you'll be able to get it. Now, when you're doing this, I want to make sure you guys know, when you're doing a reflex, watch your verbiage too, especially when you're doing your note, okay? There is hyperreflexia and there are brisk reflexes okay so you know normal reflexes are two plus out of four right so when you actually call a reflex brisk that is usually around a three plus out of four hyperreflexia is a four hyperreflexia must have clonus or it's not hyperreflexia Okay, so easiest way to pick that one up. A lot of times you'll see it on, you know, patella. It's just a little bit easier sometimes unless we've got a cervical issue. I'll always ask my patient, sir, can you please put your hands like this for me? I want you to pull as hard as you can. Really pull. It's a good distraction technique. Find, go to the end of the patella. You're going to find that little indentation. That's where you're going to hit. Nice and easy. All you're going to do is a nice little hit. Okay, now this is a nice, that's a two plus, right? Same thing on the other side, two plus. Now, when you go down to do the Achilles, you always want to tell them, keep pulling, sir, keep pulling. You are going to raise the foot and immediately go into your reflex because if you raise the foot and if they flex, you'll never get the reflex. So just go right into it. You're hitting right at the, the back of the Achilles and you'll be able to get that. Also, just as a side note, watch your return. I cannot tell you how many times when you have a slow return, look at their thyroid. Slow return is a dead giveaway for thyroid issues, okay? Now, if this was, you can stop pulling, sir. Thank you so much. Let's say this was hyperreflexic. So if I get a big reflex here, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go, okay, does this person have clonus? Clonus, just kind of move them around because you want to distract them from what you're doing. And then I simply pull up quickly, okay? Pull up quickly. Clonus is going to be this, okay? Always try to repeat it. If you've got it once, let them go. Hit it again. In kids sometimes, you young, young kids, remember, they're going to have really brisk reflexes. Kids, younger people, they're going to have brisk ones. Now, if, if you have somebody that has, let's say, lumbar degenerative disc disease, which a lot of people have, a lot of your patients will have, many times you will notice that this is not a two plus, maybe it's a two, maybe it's a one plus. Then you immediately want to start thinking about what's going on in that lower back because many times that can also suppress a reflex, okay? If I get a big 
hyperreflexia or even brisk reflexes, depending upon the rest of my exam. First thing that's going to go through my head, I've got an upper motor neuron issue. Granted, I also may have an electrolyte issue, okay, because that can cause it as well. Um, even something like hyperthyroid can cause it too. But when it comes to this, we're going to look at the whole entire person and then we're going to make a judgment call. Do I need an imaging study of the brain? Do I need one of the neck? Do I need one of the thoracic spine? In the back of your mind, you guys remember lumbar, really in the lumbar spine, L1 is where the, the cord itself ends. Everything after that is really, you know, called a quina, things like that. So really to L1, when we're talking about an upper motor neuron disease, kind of think brain, cervical, and thoracic cord, okay? If we're going to look at, at stuff like that. Now, next we're going to see a little bit. Now, I know everybody does a pronator drift. I still do a pronator drift, even though I usually don't get a heck of a lot bang for my buck out of that one. Only because if somebody has a a rotator cuff injury or something like that, it's gonna give me a false read. But just, just to, to be complete, sir, can you please hold out your arms completely for me? Good, beautiful. I'm gonna have you close your eyes, sir. Go ahead and keep those eyes closed. Now, one with a pronator, you're actually looking for this, not necessarily this. Even though you may have that, but a lot of times it can be very, very subtle. How I can actually bring this out is by saying, sir, you're gonna hear, feel me just kind of um, push on you a little bit. I do a quick tip, quick tip. And they will regulate because they're, they can't see what you're doing. They will automatically regulate. If you have somebody that goes down and does not return, that's how we know we have a little bit of an issue going on. That is a pronator, okay? Um, and just everybody's a little bit different, but um, just look at the cerebellum too, because many times that can actually um, indicate a cerebellar lesion. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Thank you so much, sir. Go ahead and open up those eyes. Now I'm gonna have you take this finger, touch your nose, and then touch my finger. Good. So what you're looking for is pass point. Go ahead and do the same thing with the other hand. Now in a perfect world, you guys, I would move my finger in different directions and have him keep doing that. What we're also looking for is any kind of positional tremor, which would mean as he touches his nose and comes closer to my finger, go ahead and touch that nose. As he comes closer to my finger, he'll start shaking more. So he'll, you'll start seeing as he gets closer and closer, he'll start to shake. That's usually more of a positional type tremor. You can see that with benign essential tremor, a couple of different things. Some medications can cause that, but that is not a sign of Parkinson's disease, okay? If you're looking for more Parkinson's, you're gonna see more of that, that kind of rubbing type, almost this small tremor. A lot of times it's very, very subtle, but you can pick it up here. The other thing is if there is concern for Parkinson's, always, always, always look at rigidity. Tell them to relax. It's really important that they relax. Just say, hey, I'm just gonna move you around a little bit. You're just checking to see if you can feel any of that cogwheeling. Same thing here. And just say, please just go ahead and just pretend that arm's sleeping for me. We're just going to go move him back and forth. You can see how nice and smooth that is. So with Parkinson's, you'll be able to feel it even more than you can see it. You will be able to feel it. Okay? All right. I'm going to have you hold those hands up for me, sir. I'm going to have you tap your first finger and your thumb fast as you can. Good. Now we're actually looking for what we call dysdiadocokinesia, them not being the same timing, okay? Now with dysdiadocokinesia, again, it can be an indication of an upper motor neuron disease, um, but <laughs> thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, so there's also, you can do it that way. Ask the patient too. If you notice something that's abnormal, say, hey, does that feel like the same to you on both sides? You'll be surprised because patients will really come forward with a lot of information. Another way I actually look for that, I'll say, sir, can you do me a favor? I want you to go back and forth for me, fast as you can. Really good, really good. So that's another way to actually look for that dysdiadocokinesia as well. Now, um, looking for that coordination, sir, I'm gonna have you take your back of your heel and I'm gonna have you run it up and down your shin for me, if you don't mind. Just up and down. 
Really good. Same thing on that other side. Good. Now, a patient with Parkinson's disease, this is going to be a very, very big challenge for them to do with the smoothness of motion is actually what we're looking for. So that gives us that kind of down and dirty way. Yes, there are a multitude of other things that you can do as well, but that's down and dirty. Okay. Now, sensory. When we're looking to test sensory. Don't make the mistake that I did many, many years ago. I used to use a safety pin. That's what they taught us with. Oh my God, my first Coumadin patient. Can I tell you how I made people bleed? It was horrifying. So please, 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 just a stupid Q-tip. Try to crack it so you get a, a sharp end, okay? Now, when you're looking at this, remember, on different areas of the cord, you're going to be soft touch is carried, vibratory sensation, temperature, pain. In a perfect world, and if we had all the time in the world, we'd be able to check each and every single one of those. Since we're not too good at doing that sometimes, again, during your exam, you're going to be able to kind of go in and say, hey, this is where my issue is. So using your, your, your tight, your little pinprick kind of thing, we're going to say first, because I want to make sure those cranial nerves are intact, you always want to test for uh, sharp sensation as well as that light touch. Sir, does this feel the same on both sides? Yes. How about here and here? Yes. Good. Here and here? Yes. Good. And again, you're trying to use the same amount of pressure on each side. It's sort of kind of tough to do sometimes, but remember that's checking for um, the uh, cranial nerve and you're specifically looking at five. Remember the distribution, you guys, is like this, right? So you always want to comment in your note, V1, V2, V3, which is, you know, five, Roman numeral five, but I just say V, a um, little bit easier. Then always look at the neck two. This is going to be C3. Sir, does this feel the same on this side as it does on this side? Yes. Good deal. Um, back of the head going into C2 and C3, do the same exact thing. Then coming out, sir, how about here and here? Is that the same? Yes. Good. Now, okay, so I can't, normally I'd lift his sleeve up, right? You know, this is C5. We would say, sir, how about here and here? Yes. Good. And here and here? Yes. Okay. Now, as I'm going, you guys, as I'm doing each one of the dermatomes, really important, if I'm going to touch on this side, I need to do the exact same thing on the other side. Okay, you don't want to get a false read. So if I'm going, hey, do you feel this? I want to do the exact same thing on this side as well. Okay, now we would do the same thing coming down on the leg. Very, very important to really pay attention to um, your L3 distribution. Remember, what is the most common herniation? If you're going to have one, it's always going to be L4, L5, almost guaranteed. Always look at the guy above it and the guy below it because those are always where you're going to find issues. So always pay attention to this full area through here when you're actually testing. That neuralgia paresthetica, remember, that sometimes can occur and patients will be very, very numb in an L3 distribution, okay? And then again, normally I would have somebody, would be obviously better in a gown, but just so we can get a little bit L5 L4 and S1. So L4 right here. Here, sir, does that feel the same? Yes. Okay. L5 here and here, is that the same? Yes. Good. And then S1, guys, going down lower. And remember, it's going to go all the way down to that, that uh, small toe. Here, sir, and here. Is that the same? Yes. Okay. Good deal. Now, say we do our whole entire thing. Sorry again, down and dirty approach. Always, always, always. If if you only have time to figure out vibratory sensation in one area, this is where I want you to do it. Patella to great toe. Your tuning fork has to be on the bone. Really important. I can go through clothes, but it's got to be on the bone. So, feel where the patella is. Sir, do you feel that? It's going to feel like a little buzz. All right. Remember how that feels because we're going to compare it from here to your great toe. I want you to tell me if there's any difference at all in that intensity from here to always grab that great toe, kind of bend it so you can make sure that you really are on top of the bone. 
Any difference there, sir? The, the toe is less. Yeah, and a lot of times you're actually going to hear that. Um, he's got a little bit of lumbar degenerative disc disease too, which is why, but that can also be a sign of B12 deficiency. Don't miss that, okay? I would do the same exact thing on this side as well. Then since I've got my tuning fork, most of the time it's kind of on the cold side. If I'm down here, I can do some temp, right? Sir, does it feel the same from here to here? Yes. Good. How about here and here? Yes. Good. And then that's one here. And here? Yes. Good. If I would have time, take off his, his socks, especially if I'm dealing with somebody with diabetes. I'm going to do a really good thorough exam down here. Now, just to make sure that you're looking at one more issue with proprioception, okay? A lot of times, um, we're going to take his sock off just for one second. Don't look at his feet, you guys. Um, we're actually going to take a look, and I'm going to say, Sir, can you please close your eyes for me? Now, what you want to do, because we want to see how is he able to perceive if that toe is up or down, hold the foot, take that toe a little bit away from the other toe, just so you don't have anybody touching. Sir, can you tell me if this toe is up or down? Up. Good. Same thing with this side, up or down. That way, at least I know proprioception-wise where we stand. This is always really important. You don't want to have somebody stand up when I'm doing the rest of the exam and not be prepared that that patient's going to fall over because they, they, their proprioception is impaired at the bottom of their feet, okay? All right, so that gives us at least a little bit of an idea. We would do the same thing, obviously, with temperature, just so I can take a look and make sure that, that those dermatomes are in place. And then we've already done a little bit on the myotomes. Sir, and I'm going to show you guys a... a this one's a little bit off the beaten path, but it's incredibly important. Sir, could you stand up for me for a minute? Good. I'm going to have you stand right here on the carpeting. Good. Now, first things first, can you please put both your feet totally together for me? Good. First things first, you guys remember, this is a Romberg. You want to see them with their eyes open. Can they balance with their eyes open? Very important. So first eyes open, patient can balance. Then put both arms on both sides of the patient. Sir, could you close your eyes for me? Now, what you're always looking for, you're going to see a little bit of movement. When you have a lot of movement, say the patient doesn't fall over, you know, obviously, which would be a positive Romberg, but they can have swaying. If they have swaying, you want to document or note negative rom Romberg, but noted swaying, because that means I've got issues that are probably a coming. Okay, and you really need to pay attention to that. Go ahead and open those eyes. Thank you, sir. I want to show you guys one more thing. Now, this you will not find in the normal books and stuff like that. This has helped me out over the years. This is actually called a Marche and Compass. Um, this is my favorite thing. It's um, guys, it's kind of like a pronator, but it takes a lot of the middle stuff out. Okay, so I'm going to ask you, sir, to bring both those arms straight out in front of you, nice and high. Good. I'm going to have you do a little march in place with your eyes open first. Just have the patient march in place if they can. And then I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and keep marching for me. Now, he's staying straight looking at me. Now, if he were, I'm going to move you. If he's going to move, I need at least 30% of a turn. That is what you guys would normally look at as a positive, you know, pronator. But this would be a really good indicator of an upper motor neuron disease. Sorry, go ahead, open your eyes. So that's a wonderful way to tell. It's far more effective than the pronator. It never lets me down. The minute I see that, I'll tell you right now, the very first thing I'm going to do, because usually that's going to correspond with some brisk reflexes or hyperreflexia, I'm going to do an MRI of the brain, okay? Um, and then just real quick, we're just going to see, I'm going to have you walk over here to the door. Obviously, I usually have patients walk. I'm going to have you turn around, sir. Um, I would have them walk down the hall someplace where I can see because remember you're looking for arm swing being intact. Um, someone with a decreased arm swing on one side, as long as you've ruled out like again a rotator cuff injury, something like that, you want to think about Parkinson's. But what I'm going to ask you to do, sir, is what's called a tandem walk. So you are going to walk one foot in front of the other, heel touching your toe, please. Good, heel touching that toe. Good. Very good, sir. Very good. Now I'm going to have you turn around. 
Now, um, with something like this, if your patient overall, you're not concerned about anything, but you notice them having a really hard time, please check their vitamin D3 levels. That can cause a, a quite a bit of issues. Now, can you walk on your toes for me, sir? Up on your toes, just like when you were a little kid. Good, go ahead and walk forward for me. Beautiful, good. Go ahead and turn around. I'm gonna have you walk on your heels with your toes off the ground. It's a great way to look for foot drop. Now, the reason you also do these little exam skills is because many times, yes, I did a motor test on him. And sometimes I don't get the full picture. But when I have him walk on his heels and toes, I'm looking at dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. I'm actually looking to see the muscles of the legs are working. But even more important, I can see if that foot is dropping on me, I know I've got an issue. And maybe I didn't pick it up on my motor exam, but I'm going to be able to pick it up here. So just a couple of down and dirty things that just the, the short version, you guys, um, but it will help a lot if you guys could help those patients out as much as possible. Neurology is not as bad as it seems, okay? Thank you so much for hanging with me. I really appreciate it.